Amen. Thank you, ladies. Good morning. It's good to see each of you here. I'm going to ask we all stand as we sing our opening song today, our call to worship, Emmanuel, which of course means God with us. Good morning. Good to be here in the house of the Lord with you this morning, this beautiful day. A few announcements as we get going. Uh, deacons, don't forget tonight there's a meeting at 5 p.m. Uh, I think we missed the last go around, didn't we? So uh, be sure to be here tonight. And then don't forget our family nights on Wednesday nights at 6. Uh, if y'all weren't here Wednesday, y'all missed some good chicken and dumplings. That's all I'm. That's all I got to say. And so uh, I don't know what's on the menu this week, but I'm sure it'll be great. So chili? All right. And then uh, don't forget our Christmas Eve candlelight service, which is, of course, on the 24th at 5 p.m. And there is a, a capacity to that, so be sure to hit the sign-up sheet out there in the foyer. Masks are going to be required. And then uh, it's the time of year for our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And there's, there's a thing in your bulletin here that, that uh, was put in there that talks a lot about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering on the inside there. 100% uh, of the donations supports the work of missionaries, and it gives you a lot of statistics here uh, from, last, from last year, so take a look at that. But it is the time of year for that, and our goal this year is $10,000. And uh, I know the Christmas card box is out here. A lot of people, you don't have to do this, but a lot of people put the cards in the boxes out here to keep from having to spend money on postage. And then they take that money that they would have spent and give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. I know that's something a lot of people do, so uh, if you want to do that, that, that's great. And then uh, don't forget our Christmas celebration uh, will be next Sunday, the 13th, at the 11 a.m. service. I've heard some of the music already. Sounding pretty good, isn't it, sure. Pastor Doug? All right, so look forward to that next week. Good to be with you all this morning. And I believe we've got uh, video coming up, or no, that's Pastor Dan first, according to this. <laughs> we'll do it either way. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here today on this uh, beautiful Sunday. Uh, nice, cool, crisp weather. Feels like Christmas time, at least in the weather. I know we're all trying to still get adjusted to it, actually feeling like Christmas somewhat. But we are glad you're here today. If you're here for the very first time, I do want to encourage you to take a card out off the back of the pew in front of you, fill it out, and drop it in the offering plate. We welcome you here today. Um, <clears throat> I want to encourage you to be in prayer about our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Every penny that you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to international missions. Not a dime of it stays here. Over 50% of the budget of the International Mission Board is dependent upon the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal this year is $10,000. I pray we exceed that by a long way. But I want to encourage you uh, to give and to give faithfully to that. Just let the Lord lead you in that. 
Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then after I pray, we'll have a video from the International Mission Board. Father, we thank you for your love, for your amazing grace, Lord, for the privilege of being able to be in your house today to worship you. God, we lift up <clears throat> our international missionaries right now and ask you to be with them and minister to their needs, Lord. Work through them in a powerful way that we might see many added to the kingdom of God. And God, we pray that we as a church would be faithful givers to this important offering. God, you be with us today. Direct our steps. Help us to glorify you in all we do. May we focus our attention upon you as we sing your praise. And then, God, as we study your word, open our hearts and minds to hear from you today. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. We have certain stories in the New Testament like the parable of the lost sheep where you leave 99 to go find the one. And so God doesn't forsake that one lost sheep. You have these small micro people groups where the gospel has not flowed yet because of geography, because of distance, because of cost, because of uh, culture, because of racism. I really feel that these micro peoples are part of his heart to go after all the sheep, to go after that remnant. In the Amazon, you can go a day without seeing another living soul, which is kind of freaky. But a lot of the reason why you can't see people is because they're hidden. These are hidden peoples, small in population, widely dispersed. They have centuries of a bloody history where they've been exploited. They're animists, they believe in spirits. When you live that way, you tend to be dominated by fear. I see marginalized people, I see forgotten people, I see invisible people that are in desperate need of the gospel. The area is massive, and so to get from where I live, which is already a jungle city, I have to get into a land plane and fly to another port city, and then the next day we'd get in a boat, and in this slow boat we travel sometimes three days to get to where we're going. Because we're going into areas where the gospel's not, sometimes it just takes time. But recently we have noticed just God opening some doors. God has been working to send out missionaries, indigenous men and women, where there's no evangelical presence. A well-trained and called indigenous man will be much more effective. They tend to be able to get into hard reach areas without government restrictions. You have fewer language limitations. A lot of my work is training them. So if I want to teach an indigenous man how to do story, he has to see me do it first. Then after a while of walking alongside, he's very capable at that point one partner in particular, he wants to go work with a group that has killed outsiders that have walked in. He's like, I don't care. God sent me to go do it. And this is such a, a 180 from most indigenous culture that you have to look at him and say, God brought this change to this man. Do you see families coming to Christ? Do you do see village headmans getting permission to come in? It really confirms everything that we're out there to do, to go out and make disciples of all nations. When we have those things happen, we sit back and go, okay, this is what it's all about. They can go and they can teach others, and those people can teach others. I want to see this momentum like a wave through the jungle where I can say, look, I didn't see it happen. I wasn't there, but I know the gospel has reached these dark corners. When supporters of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering gives, it allows us to do things like buy an outboard motor that gets us up river, to get equipment that we need to help us stay out there in the jungle. I've been supported by Lottie Moon. Y'all's generosity is, is a luxury that I never want to take for granted. So I want to say thank you for that. God is faithful in the hard times as he is in the good times, and our mandate doesn't change. These people groups in the jungle, you could be born, live, and die without ever hearing the name of our Savior. So someone has to go, because if we don't go, no one's going to go. If we don't train people to go, no one's going to go. It's worth it. I was listening and watching that story. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. And it really helps to bring to my thinking, anyway, 
the, the reality of what Jesus did in coming to the earth and why this is so important to as, what is our purpose in being here at all, any of us. First is to establish a relationship with the Lord. And he's provided that avenue through his son, Jesus Christ, to get us to that point. And then what are the two greatest commandments? To love the Lord thy God and to love your, your neighbor as yourself. That is, that's it in a nutshell. Get our hearts right with the Lord. Then we can relate to our neighbor properly too and tell them you can have that relationship with him too. When he came in the form of, of his son, Jesus Christ, that was a big deal. So the prophecies had been made for hundreds of years to the Hebrews, and he came to be um, in his son, Jesus Christ. Let all mortal flesh keep silence, and O come, O come, Emmanuel. keep silence and with fear and trembling stand ponder nothing earthly minded for with blessing in his hand Christ our God to earth descended our full homage to demand. At his feet the six-winged seraph, cherubim with sleepless eye, veiled their faces to the presence, as with ceaseless voice they cry, Alleluia, 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 Lord Most High. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. This is the second week of Advent, and the Mullinex family is going to come and share in the lighting of the, the Advent candle for us.
Lord's. Soften our hearts, break down our resistance, open us anew to your life and love that we may be transformed and may be agents of transformation in the lives of others. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I'm going to ask we stand at this time and sing our next song, Oh Come All Ye Faithful, number 89 in our hymn books. to remain standing as we sing our next song, Goodness of God. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so. Father, I've known you as a friend, 
And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you Goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. It's running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so time we'd like to dismiss our children to children's church for preschoolers through third grade amen all right they're excited too yeah i'm going to ask you to join as we remain seated and we're going to continue with our next song joy to the world the lord is come <laughs> Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. 
Go ahead and take out your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, we're going to deal with verses 1 through 8 in just a moment. When I hear the word foursome, I know this is going to come as a surprise to you, but I immediately think golf. No, that's shocking. But you know, on most golf courses, they'll let you play in as many as four, or a foursome. They won't let you play five. Some golf courses maybe during the week, but definitely not on the weekend. You can't play five. So you play in a foursome, but on the PGA Tour, typically they'll play in either threesomes or twosomes. Uh, and then the Masters every year in April, on Thursday and Friday, they'll play in threesomes. And then when they cut the field by, based on their score, then it becomes twosomes on the weekend. This year, however, with it being playing in, played in November because of the shorter daylight, they kept them in threesomes on the weekend and actually went off both sides so that they could get done before dark. One year, uh, we were at the Masters uh, for, the for the practice round on Wednesday, which is also the par three tournament. And in one of the groups, we actually got to see Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, and Gary Player playing together, which was really a cool thing to get to see those great champions playing together and having fun. But when you add in there fearsome, that takes my mind away from golf. <laughs> I don't think of too many golfers and go, fearsome, foursome. Uh, that, that, that lends itself more toward football. And the first fearsome, foursome, so the 1960s Los Angeles Rams, their defensive line. Now, this line had four players on it that were all very good players. They actually only played together for four seasons, but three of them remained very popular after professional football. Two of them became Hall of Famers, but three of them because of acting careers and things of that sort, following the game of football, uh, their names stayed in the public eye. You'll recall Deacon Jones, Merlin Olson, and Rosie Greer. Who can name the fourth one of the fearsome foursome? I'm just curious. Anybody here know who the fourth lineman was in that four-year span? See, I, I, I didn't remember his name either. Lamar Lundy. Lamar Lundy was the fourth player in that line and when you consider the day, it's pretty incredible. The 1960s, you know, people just weren't as big in the 1960s. Football players in particular were not as big in the 1960s as they are now. But this defensive line, uh, Lamar Lundy was the tallest of the group. He was 6'7". The other three guys all were 6 feet 5 inches tall. And it's said that they weighed in at 265 pounds, although Deacon Jones said of... Marlon Olson, that he never played a down in his football career, that he wasn't at least 290. Uh, so they were big guys given the day, the 1960s, this group of guys playing together. One of the amazing stats that comes out of that for me is Merlin Olson played in the NFL 15 years. He made the Pro Bowl 15 times. So literally from the beginning of his career to the end of his career, he was great and dominated on the defensive line. I'll never forget... Uh, some of you may recall that Deacon Jones had a patented move uh, when he played the defensive line that is now illegal. In his day, it was legal to slap the helmet of the offensive lineman, and that was his deal. He had a big hand, he was a big, strong guy, and he would literally slap the helmet of the offensive lineman to disorient him so that he could get past him. Uh, Merlin Olson was a little, a little different from that. He would just overpower uh, the offensive lineman. But no offense to these guys, they were fearsome, foursome for sure, but that fearsome, foursome is cotton candy and rainbows compared to the fearsome, foursome we're about to look at in the Revelation. Last week we examined the scroll and we found out that only Jesus was worthy to open the scroll. This week we're going to take a look at what happens when Jesus begins to open these seals and we're going to look at the first four seals of this scroll. This is indeed a fearsome foursome. So let's take a look at our text. Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, and I'll ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Revelation 6, verse 1. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out as a conqueror in order to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its rider was allowed to take peace from the earth so that 
people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given to him. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a set of scales in his hand. Then I heard something like a voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following after him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild animals of the earth. May the Lord add richly to the reading of his word. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that your word is not a truth, but is the truth. God, open our hearts and minds that we might indeed hear from you today. God, I pray that I might decrease, that you might increase. And may your truth be spoken here. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to look at a real fearsome foursome. And first of all this morning, I want you to see the first seal. You're going to notice in this sermon that I got very creative about my points. So this is the first seal. You might be able to figure out the rest of them from that. I'm just saying. But the Lamb with a capital L, that is Jesus Christ, opens the first seal, one of the four living creatures at that point says, Come. And in response to his commanding voice, a rider on a white horse comes into view for John. Now we know from all the cowboy movies, of course, that the good guys ride white horses and wear white hats, right? Isn't that the way that it works? The good guys are on the white horses. But don't be fooled by that. This is not a good guy. He only appears to be a good guy. Now, there are some who try to assert that this is Jesus connecting this with Revelation 19.11, but there's way too much evidence in this text that doesn't support that. There's way too, there are way too many things here that lend itself toward this being someone else. So first of all, Jesus is the one opening the seals. So think logically for a moment. If Jesus is the one opening the seals, why in the world would he hop on a horse and ride off when there are more seals to be opened? So just from a logistical, logic standpoint, It doesn't make sense that he would be the one on this first horse. Secondly, this rider is said to be wearing a crown, but in the Greek, the word for crown there is the word stephanos, and it has to do with the victor's crown. Whenever the crown is referred to in relation to Christ, it is the diadema or the diadem, the royal crown, not to be confused with R.C. Cola. That's a different royal crown. But, The third clue that we have here that this is not Jesus is that this rider carries a bow rather than a sword. Later in Revelation 19.11, we see that Jesus is said to have a sword in his mouth because he speaks the truth. But the final point that would lead us to conclude that this is not Jesus is that Jesus' second coming doesn't happen until the end of the tribulation. So why in the world would would he be on a horse riding down to earth here at the beginning of the tribulation? It just doesn't make sense to say that this is Jesus. It makes far more sense to say that this is someone else. So hopefully we can at least agree at this point, it's not Jesus. But then who is it? Well, that's, that's a great question. There are really, really two logical lines of thought that follow here as to who this might be. It very well could be, it very well might be the Antichrist. It could be the Antichrist here. Dr. Um, Paige Patterson in his commentary falls on that side of this, and it makes sense because the Antichrist is to bring a false peace to begin with, and that's what we see happening here as we unfold this seal. So there's there's a reasonable argument, a reasonable logical conclusion that this could be the Antichrist. There's also one other logical conclusion that could be true here, and it simply could be this idea of peace. Why, Why would I say, well, it could be the idea of peace? Well, if you'll notice... The subsequent riders here are war, famine, and death. So it could be that this rider is actually just peace, the idea of peace. Dr. John MacArthur in his commentary falls on that side of the debate. Either one, frankly, is reasonable. Either one fits the context. And to be honest, I don't need a definitive answer myself to know what's going on here. I don't have to know for sure who it is. It frankly doesn't matter. God knows who it is, and he's the one in charge. So I don't have to worry about this. This is not a detail that overwhelms me or concerns me. Either way, this rider brings peace, 
but it's a false peace that's going to be brief. Folks, we're living in a day and age that is ripe with gullible people and gullible responses. We have people that have been indoctrinated in liberal thought that actually believe college and health care can be free. Now, if you're one of them, I'm sorry, I love you, but that is an impossibility. There is nothing plausible about that. Stop and think for just a minute. I mean, a little logic, a little critical thinking, and you'll see how implausible that idea is. Ask yourself how many professors are going to stand in the classroom and teach for free. They have to pay bills. They have to eat. They have electric bills. They have mortgages. They can't afford to teach for free. How many textbook companies are going to provide you with that digital textbook as it is now? For those of you who don't know, okay? If you haven't been around the scene very much, textbooks for most college classes are digital. There's still some print, but most of them are digital copies now. So, but they, <laughs> let me tell you, you would think that with it being digital, hey, it'd be 15 bucks. No, it's still 150 bucks. It's just a reality. And they're not going to give those away for free. It's not going to happen. How many colleges can afford to turn on the lights, turn on the water? How many can afford to take care of buildings for free? There's nothing free about it. There's no way for it to be free. Somebody has to pay the bill. Some people want to be paid. People want to be able to do and eat and all those sorts of things that are all a part of the support staff of the college. But there's simply no way for it to be, well, the government can pay it. Hold on a minute. Please explain to me how the government gets money. Where does the government make money? There you go, Ralph. You know exactly where he makes money from. You! We're where the money for the government comes from. The government is not a producer. It is a taker. It takes from us. Not producing money. Yeah, I know it can print money. But the more money you print, the more you devalue the money. Therefore, you have more inflation and things cost more. Sorry for the economic lesson. But it's a reality. I know most of you understand this and know this, but there are people in our country who are gullible, and that's my point. They think medical care can be free. Well, long before Obamacare was ever in place, somebody who needed emergency care could go to the ER and get treatment. Law required that they had to be treated. So health care for the poor has been on the books for a long, long time. A long time. But here again, somebody's got to pay for bandages. Somebody's got to pay for lights. All those things have to be paid for. And again, the government cannot produce income. It can only take yours. And if you take away my incentive, I don't mind reasonable taxes because I understand there are things that we... I want to drive on a road that doesn't feel like I'm riding in a horse and buggy. Okay? You know, I, I get that. I, I want to have law enforcement in place. I want to have first responders out there. I'm grateful for those folks. So I don't mind reasonable taxes, but I'm not interested in paying... 50 or 60% tax so that somebody who's lazy can go sit in a classroom and get an underwater basket weaving degree that will do nothing for them when they get out of college. I realize that's not an actual degree, but anyway. <laughs> you get my point. Simple economics make it clear that you can't have these things for free. It also, the reality is um, the fact that <laughs> that people want these things for free, they don't realize the trickle-down effect of how that impacts so many along the way and don't even get me started on the idea of making minimum wage $15 an hour. But that sounds like a good idea up front, but you're not unpacking it. Nevertheless, there are those walking around with expensive educations who think health care and school, college in particular, can be free. The, the, the truth is they might have book sense, but if their common sense were converted to dynamite, they couldn't blow their nose. <laughs> Sorry. Sadly, I see more than enough evidence in the world around me today to know that there will be plenty of people who will go right along with the Antichrist. Hook right inside of that big cheek being reeled in by the false peace that the Antichrist will present right at the beginning of the tribulation. But folks, it will be very short-lived. 
So we have the first seal. Next, I want you to, <laughs> I know you didn't see that coming, but the second seal, okay? I know, I know. I tricked you there, threw you a curveball. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its rider was allowed to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given to him. Now the scene becomes very grim quickly. The peace that had been here with the first seal is abruptly ended. The second living creature says, Come, and the second horse and rider show up, and this horse is described in the Christian Standard Version as fiery red. Now red is the color of fire and of blood, and it depicts war. God's judgment descends and war breaks out as the people of the world slaughter one another. This rider takes peace from the earth, and war, unlike anything that we've seen before, will take place on the earth, will cover the earth. I know there, there are some folks in our church who uh, were at least close to being around for World War II. And others of you have lived through Korea and Vietnam. But folks, wars that we've seen take place in our lifetime don't even remotely compare to what we're talking about here in Scripture. We're going to unpack it more as these seals are broken. But the word here for sword is a reference to the short sword. Don't say that too fast the short sword that Roman soldiers carried, and this was literally used in hand-to-hand combat in battle. It was an assassin's sword. The Antichrist plays a prominent role in this war, and those who had been wooed by his platitudes and his lies of peace will begin to see how wicked and vicious he is. Daniel tells us a lot about him. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 24, we find this, His power will be great, but it will not be his own. He will cause outrageous destruction and succeed in whatever he does, he will destroy the powerful along with the holy people. Daniel gives us a lot more detail on him in Daniel chapter 11, beginning in verse 36. And if you'll bear with me, it's kind of a lengthy passage, but this is all description of what we're talking about right here as far back as the book of Daniel. So Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Then the king will do whatever he wants. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and he will say outrageous things against the God of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed because what has been decreed will be accomplished. He will not show regard for the gods of his fathers, the God desired by women, or for any other God because he will magnify himself above all. Instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God his fathers did not know, with gold, silver, precious stones, and riches. He will deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. He will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, making them rulers over many and distributing land as a reward. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, but the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will invade countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, and many will fall, but these will escape from his power, Edom. Moab and the prominent people of the Ammonites. He will extend his power against the countries and not even the land of Egypt will escape. He will get control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and the Cushites will also be in submission. But reports from the east and the north will terrify him and he will go out with great fury to annihilate and completely destroy many. He will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain, but he will meet his end with no one to help him. One of the things that you need to understand, even as we look at what the Antichrist will do, God is still on the throne. And the time of judgment will be limited as to what God will allow it to take place or how long God will allow it to take place. He will reap a lot of havoc. He will destroy. He will be a tool in God's hand even though he thinks he's fighting against God here's the hard part for us to really accept and appreciate even in God's judgment he is perfect and even in God's judgment he is glorified judgment's a horrible thing and the fact that there will be great judgment going on is a horrible thing 
But we need to understand God is still in control. God is still on the throne. The Antichrist is looking out for himself. He establishes his peace only to stab all those that he had established peace with in the back. His plan all along was to destroy others. So we see the first seal and the second seal. Next, I want you to see, wait for it, the third seal. I know, I know, that's, that's surprising. Didn't see that coming, did you? When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a set of scales in his hand. Then I heard something like a voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, we have here a third broken seal, and the third living creature following the pattern of the first two says, Come. And a third horse and rider step into the scene. This horse is black, and its rider has scales in his hands. Black is associated with famine. In Lamentations 5, verse 10, our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. When you stop and consider that worldwide war has happened, famine is bound to follow. Consider the fact that farmers have left the fields because they've gone to battle. No one is plowing, no one is planting, sowing, and reaping a harvest because they're at war. The people who work in the canneries, the people who work in the production houses for for chicken and beef and all those sorts of things, they're at war. Those places have likely been destroyed to some degree. So all of the things that were part of the production line that you and I are so used to, they're gone. You realize right down the road here, there's about 4 million pounds of chicken every week produced just down the hill, just down 282 at Pilgrim's. All those things are shut down. All those things are stopped. The, The production chain is gone. People are starving now. People are seeing war take place around them and they don't have anywhere to turn for food. And you can imagine how carnal people become in the midst of something like that. Famines have happened in the past. Wars have happened in the past. But nothing in history will even compare to what will take place. Now the scales that are carried in the rider's hand here picture the idea that food will be rationed out. There won't be enough food to go around as it is now most of the time when you and I go out to eat. If we eat everything in front of us, we walk out going... Why in the world did I eat all that? You know, it's like that old Roll Aids commercial. You remember? I can't believe I ate the whole thing. You know, it's it's just we we eat too much. We have food left over. We take food home to cook the next day. But in this time, there won't even be enough food to go around. In fact, during the Depression, people in the U.S. had to ration food because there wasn't enough to go r- around. The text tells us how bad this rationing will be. It says a quart of wheat is barely is barely enough food here to sustain one person for one day, but it will cost a day's wages. Now let's just say for the sake of discussion that a good that a decent salary, a day's wages would be two hundred dollars today. Enough food for one person for one day would cost $200. That means that big bowl of Frosted Flakes that I like, Kathy, it's going to cost me $200. Now, barley, how does barley fit in this? Barley's not as good as wheat. It doesn't have as many nutrients as wheat, but a day's amount of wages would provide enough barley for a family for a day. So this, okay, is store brand cornflakes. Not even enough to have sugar on them, much less Kellogg's. This is the store brand cornflakes. I mean, this is not the good stuff at all. But seriously, things will be so bleak that even a day's worth of, worth of work will barely provide food for a family at a very weak, meager kind of food. At this point, the writer is told not to destroy the oil and the wine. Olive trees and vineyards, for whatever reason, are not on the list at this point to be destroyed in this judgment. But you can imagine that things get desperate. Kind of like things have gotten desperate once again 
with toilet paper and paper towels. I don't know what it is, people. The world's coming to an end. Quick, go get some toilet paper. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. It seems like there might be a couple other things that might be important. I'm just saying. But apparently toilet paper's at the top of the list. I don't know. Anyway, but this time of famine that will come during this will be worse than anything. Any famine ever in history. So we see the first seal, and we see the second seal, and then we see the third seal. So what do we have next? I know, the fourth seal. Okay, there it is. The fourth seal. So let's look at verses 7 and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following after him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild animals of the earth. Now, things have gotten bad, but they're, they're getting even worse now. This fourth horse is a pale green color, and some translations translate it as an ashen horse. And the Greek here is the word chloros, and it's the word that we get our word chlorophyll or chlorine from, and it refers to a sickly pale yellow-green color. This color carries with it the idea of death. Some say that the skin in a dead body favors the color that's being described here. The scene is getting grim on earth. War and murder are rampant. Famine and plague are spreading across one-fourth of the earth, even to the extent that the wild animals no longer have enough to eat, so they're turning and attacking human beings and preying upon humans. Now, you know, in general, when you hear of attack from a wild animal, it happens, but it's an anomaly. It doesn't typically happen. But during this time, it will be routine. It will become the norm, not the exception. That momentary peace that people experienced at the very beginning of the tribulation will seem like eons ago now that all of this is breaking loose. And in a short period of time, one-fourth of the population of the world will be destroyed. Currently, about 7.6 billion people on planet Earth. That means one-fourth would be 1.9 billion people. In the United States, we have not even reached, with this pandemic, we have not even reached 1% yet in losses. Any death is a bad death. I'm not downplaying that at all, but I'm giving you a contrast. We have, we've got to get to 328,000 to get to 1%. We're talking 1.9 billion with a B. That's an enormous number of people. God's judgment will be taking place place and death will be rampant i can't imagine the hysteria that will be in the media when we see the hysteria that's been over covid 19 some of it perhaps merited a lot of it not even remotely merited but we see over and over how people have just played this up all to hopefully get you to click on their story to get you to pay attention to what they're seeing. And in this case, we'll see people turning against one another more and more, paranoid and living in constant fear. Living during this pandemic has been an odd time for sure with the social distancing and mask stuff. You know, we, we kind of we meet somebody for the first time these days. We don't know whether to uh, extend our hand because you know, that's what we're used to doing or, or we put our elbow out or we just keep our distance, you know, we, we just don't kind of know how to handle things anymore. And I'll have to admit, I know this is going to sound bad for a pastor to admit this from the pulpit, I have to admit, out in public, I kind of like the social distancing thing. I don't like crowds, I don't like people pressing in upon me. The only place I've, I've said this, and this is the honest to goodness truth, the only place I like crowds is at church. I don't like crowds out shopping, I don't like people up in my bubble. That is just, I'm not into that. 
that just no Mm-mm. and it, you know I'm not talking about BO or anything like that I just like my space I was in Walmart one day last week returning something at the customer service line and there was somebody standing within three feet of me <laughs> I wanted to say social distancing people six feet six feet I resisted the urge with Thanksgiving recently I thought it was kind of uh, you know kind of interesting some of these northern governors and mayors and such coming out and saying you know you got to wear masks in your home you can't have but four or six people in your home I mean what are we doing are we turning neighbors are we turning folks in now Hey, I don't know, I won't let you know over, uh, over at the Sheriff's Department, uh, Bruce, he's got 12 people in his house. I think you need to be able to pay him a visit. I mean, seriously, is that what we're supposed to do? Is that how we're supposed to treat people? We shouldn't have to be paranoid about people and what they're doing or about what people are saying about us. But take any anxiety that you might have felt along the way and listen. This virus is obviously a real virus. I'm not trying to make light of the virus at all. It's taken the lives of at least two people that I know personally. It's serious. But take any anxiety that you have felt through this when there's been a death rate of less than 1%. And now consider a death rate of 25%. Nearly 2 billion people. And imagine how much more the anxiety, the distrust, the hatred that will exist during this time. Remember, the church has been raptured out. The church is not here for this. With so many deaths happening, there won't be enough funeral homes or grave sites or heavy equipment to dig the graves for funerals. There'll be mass graves all over the globe with two billion people dead because of God's judgment. It's a horrible thought. It's a horrible thing to think about and I'm so grateful to know that the church will not be here for this. When the church is gone, things deteriorate rapidly with no salt and no light left here. Things will get bleak in a hurry. We've, we've examined just four of these seals. Lord willing, in two weeks, we'll examine seal five and six. That's the rest of chapter six. We don't get to seal number seven until chapter eight. So chapter seven gives us a little different information in there, a little unpacking of some of this. So we'll address those things as we come along. We're not going to skip over anything. We're going to cover it all. But I say in two weeks because next Sunday we have our Christmas music. So I hope you can be here for that and be a part of that service. But I pray that you and I as believers in Christ would first of all take joy in the fact that we don't face God's judgment because we belong to Him. And as excited as we get about that, and we should be excited about that, I also pray our hearts would be broken for those that we know that don't know Christ. Because if He returns and He calls us out, they're going to live through this. Now one thing I am grateful for and I am absolutely convinced of and I will do everything I can to try to show you in Scripture that I believe this is absolutely true, there will be people who come to faith in Christ during the tribulation. I am absolutely convinced of that. The gracious God that we serve will have 144,000 Jewish witnesses testifying to His truth and people will be saved during the tribulation, even during a time of judgment. And we'll dig into that next week because during the, the fifth seal, we will see that there are actually tribulation saints who are under the altar who have been saved through the tribulation. But the atrocities that they will experience, you've seen just a little of already. But we need to be burdened for those that we know that don't know Christ. 
I would dare say we have family members or friends that if Christ were to return today, they would deal with the tribulation. If their life were required of them today, their eternity would be sealed, separated from God. We need to pray for those that we know that don't know Christ. And we need to ask God to help us have a burden for them and do all that we can to love them to Christ. I realize sometimes we have people that we can't even hardly talk to about it because they get so defensive, then we've got to love them to Christ. We've got to keep serving them and showing them the love of Christ in everything that we do because they don't want to hear about it, but they can see it in us whether they acknowledge that's what it is or not. If you're here and you've never placed your faith in Christ, don't let this day go by. Don't let this moment go by without asking Christ into your life. Place your trust in Him. Let me assure you of this. I don't know what problems you may have, what burdens you may have, what concerns you in this life. God is big enough to take care of whatever it is. Would you give it to Him today? Let God have His way in your life right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your love. We thank You for amazing grace. God, I thank you for the fact that you take care of our every concern, our every need, our every burden. Lord, you, you don't promise that you'll just suddenly wipe it away when we ask you to wipe it away, but you do promise to carry us through it. You do promise to work it out for our good. So God, I pray we trust those burdens to you. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, anyone that hasn't placed their faith in you, and I pray... Right now, they'd ask your forgiveness and invite you into their life. And God, for each of us as Christians, I pray we would live with the joy of the knowledge of this victory over death and the grave because of what you did for us. But I pray also we would live with the urgency to see those around us who don't yet know you come to know you because we don't want them to face your judgment. God, you direct this invitation time right now, and may you be glorified in this place. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand for a hymn of invitation. Let God lead you right now. Thank you.